Hi everyone and welcome to this bonus Open Core Talk event. My name is Leila Bumbra and I am the Programme Manager for the Research Forum here at the Core Talk. And this evening I will leave it up to our wonderful speakers to explain in more detail about this fantastic project and also to tell you exactly what will be on the agenda in today's presentations. I am kicking off with the boring bit, the housekeeping. So this event will involve a number of presentations and there will also be an opportunity for you to ask your own questions at the end. So please do put these in the chat throughout the event and we will get to as many of them as we possibly can later on. Please do also use um, get in contact with us on social media. We are at Court of Res. It is now my pleasure to hand over to Nadim Salman, Dean Red Philosophy at University College London, before receiving his PhD from the Courtauld Institute of Art. Um, he was co-director of Import Projects E.V in Berlin from 2012 to 2019, and concurrently curator Tezan Borna Misa, Art Contemporary Vienna, in this was between 2013 and 2015. He curated the fourth Marrakesh Biennale with Carson Kahn in 2012, and the fifth Moscow Biennale for Young Art in 2015. He co-founded and co-curated the first Antarctic Biennale in 2017 and the Antarctic Pavilion in Venice 2015. So lots and lots of things going on there. Um, in 2014, Foreign Policy Magazine named him among the 100 leading global thinkers. So it is my absolute pleasure to invite Nadim to take over the stage and welcome him back to the Courtauld. I will leave it in your capable hands. Thank you very much, Leila, and it's so wonderful to be back at Courtauld virtually. I really had hoped to visit uh, you all in real life in the building, um, but it's uh, still a great pleasure to be back um, with, with an institution I, I love so much and uh, where I spent so many profitable times, um, both intellectually and socially. And it's with that in mind that, uh, you know, this project that I'm working on for KW Institute for Contemporary Art in Berlin, um, comes back to Courtauld. Um, somehow I always carry, uh, you know, a little bit of thought um, for the, the sort of culture of dialogue um, that I experienced at the research forum. And uh, I thought it would be wonderful to unfold this project um, with Charles Stankiewicz, of which you'll hear more in your company, not least because it is a project um, that engages with a uh, particular historical figure, of course, um, the late uh, Sir Anthony Blunt, a former uh, director here at Courtauld, and of course, uh, a colorful figure in so many regards. Um, but before Charles describes his work um, uh, concerning Blunt, I'd like to talk about how uh, this work came to be commissioned by myself and for KW Institute in Berlin. Firstly, KW Institute is um, was founded in 1991 by Klaus Biesenbach. It's founded as an artists association. Ultimately, it has become something like the city's unofficial Kunsthalle. Um, we have celebrated 30 years of exhibitions this year um, with a, quite a, an extensive program. And one of the things on this program uh, for which I was responsible as curator uh, was a, a series of online commissions um, and indeed an online platform called Open Secret. Um, so this took the form of a, a sort of a standalone website that sort of cannibalizes the KW main page in some way. Um, and there uh, I commissioned something like 26 uh, new projects ranging from digital first artistic commissions, that is to say uh, standalone websites or online projects of certain sort, um, new artist videos, uh, texts by philosophers, critics, art historians, and so on. And um, still more besides, I would show you a little bit uh, about it, but uh, the sort of the theme that draws these, uh, these various commissions together, which were rolling out on a monthly basis, I would say about three or four artworks um, per month um, for six months. And we enter now December in a couple of days for our last our last drop, as we call it, the theme that uh, unites all these artworks. And the sort of provocation I, I gave to artists around how we generally relate to technology or, or, or rather how, uh, how artists um, attempt or can attempt to um, visualize or 
in a way, uh, you know, create images of, of, uh, of, of, the t of the ways in which we don't understand technology. So let's just say technology is supposed to increase our access to knowledge, making the world more legible, of course, while undermining ignorance and superstition. And at least that's what we're told. But doesn't it sometimes feel like we've entered a, a new dark age of black boxes? In computer science, a black box is a unit of software or hardware that interacts entirely through its interface. What happens inside it is opaque, veiled in shadow. Users of black boxes may only partially understand how they work, but can easily observe their effects in the real world. This is a black box. Um, it, it reorders our personal life. Um, think of dating apps. I think just the way we meet people. Um, it can reorder our economy, even the way cities are uh, organized. Um, think of how Airbnb has totally changed the fabric of certain European centers. Um, so there are these sort of these, these black boxes that reorder the, the, the life world um, of which we cannot help but having something to do with, in a way we're kind of, we're forced to work with them um, in some cases. Um, and yet we don't know how they work necessarily. We may know what goes in and what comes out, uh, but we really don't know how the, how the sausage is made. Um, and I think there's drama, desire, disappointment, and uncertainty in coming to terms with, with this uh, situation. I think that uh, so much contemporary intellectual labor is frequently defined by attending a black box as it works on you. And I think there's a certain, I, one, perhaps one of the ways to describe contemporary culture is that it's marked by affective responses to, black, to the profusion of black boxes in our everyday life. Wonder, paranoia, mythopoesis, and so on. I think that black boxes are key props in the personal political drama of being shut out from a hidden order of reality, unable to access or read its code. Um, and as we make our way through a landscape of inscrutable machines and the life they make for us, we attempt to come to terms with them through incommensurate means. We project wishes onto them, insecurities, and we offer analogies of what they might be. And this is pretty interesting when it comes to digital culture, because of course, uh, you know, the, the sort of the, the code behind the interface, uh, you, know, it, it, you know, is ones and zeros. Um, that's, you know, digits. Um, the digital is, you know, a case of either zero or one. Um, it's, it's not a case of analogy. And so when you say, well, it kind of works like this, it kind of, you know, I kind of think my iPhone is doing this. Um, we are sort of, what we're doing is we're sort of trafficking an analog culture of the digital. Um, so, I so I've asked artists to kind of pursue this topic through their commissions. And I, and I really, I wanted them just to think about you know, how, how are sort of, to, to sort of how, how are secrets staged in public life and, and where does technology come into the picture um, for them? Um, and uh, so the result is a website. And if you'll permit me, I will just show you a little, uh, share my screen and offer uh, this little um, sort of preview video of the site. It was created very early on in, in the project, or this is, so not all the projects are up there, but you see when you come onto the website, the screen is totally black and you have to sort of uncover it with your cursor. Um, this is the first sort of website as exhibition project I've ever produced. I'm, I'm mostly interested in site specific art and digging holes and making exhibitions in, 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 in very physical or sort of places like Antarctica. But one of the, perhaps the continuum between a, curating a project in Antarctic and producing this, this, uh, this project is, you know, this question of uh, accessibility, you know, uh, a Biennale in Antarctica is, uh, you know, by definition, only accessible to uh, a few people. Now, if you see this video, uh, the, the whole visual um, uh, treatment plays between sort of uh, access and exclusion, kind of like what, what is clear and what is blurry. Um, so in some, in some senses, visually, uh, you know, we, we kind of play with that inaccessibility, but, um, uh, in other senses, we, we really care about, uh, accessibility. We have, uh, sign language interpretation for, for each project. 
and we have a glossary. But of course, uh, we also try to make each part of this mediating uh, apparatus a uh, space for you know, content as well. If you look at the interpreter, you'll see that their face is blurring all the time. Uh, and sort of, in fact, it's a, it's a live AI composite um, that is attempting to scramble their facial features so that it can't be recognized by um, ma machine facial recognition algorithms. So this was a, a commission uh, for an artist and hacker named Adam Harvey. Um, so this is, just, and the site kind of is, uh, you know, multilingual and various other things. Um, so um, not, I don't want to show you too much. Um, and I would stop sharing my screen, but I would invite you to visit the project at um, kw minus Berlin um, dot de, and there uh, you might find various uh, projects, including, of course, Charles Stanky, which is wonderful exhibition project, um, which is a reimagination of a physical exhibition uh, for this digital space, using the kind of architectures uh, that can perhaps only exist uh, when we when we produce uh, for this domain. Um, so, so it's an experiment for me to, to ask this uh, of, of Charles, um, and I am really pleased with the result, and I, I'd like to invite Charles to uh, show us his, his work and tell us more about it. I'll be happy to discuss Open Secret and the general framing of the project, uh, if, if that's interesting later on. Great. Thanks, Nadim. Um, it's a real pleasure to have been um, asked for the commission. It was great to kind of um, dig deep into the archives um, and pull out a project which definitely looks at a historical element, looks at the 1620s, um, looks at the 20th century, um, but it's great to contextualize it because really as it starts in that historical moment, it, it does uh, eventually lead into contemporary issues like crypto art and free ports. Um, and NFTs and the things that are circulating today in regards to these ideas of what is secrecy and um, what are these utopian concepts of openness. Um, I'm going to also just in the background show the, um, the project as kind of an intro. Um, the, uh, the aspect that Nadim mentioned of it being in a physical exhibition, because this too is an experiment for me. I'm mainly dealing with site-specific work, field work, um, out in the landscape and, and installations. So to do something virtual was a, was a great challenge. Um, and it really was, in a certain sense, not reverse engineering, but rather rethinking spatial um, arrangements of images. And so we'll get to that at the end when we talk more about, I think, the, the Warburg Library and Warburg's um, aesthetic kind of choices. What you're seeing really is kind of the painting, which becomes the key as it flips around to an x-ray, which happened at the National Gallery um, and, uh, and was part of the inspiration for the project. Um, also, really thanks to the Courtauld for inviting me today. It's a little bit of a return um, uh, in a sense for the project um, to have this trilateral relation between Germany, Canada, and London, particularly the Courtauld, become apparent within the actual narrative that I'm looking at. We're going to focus today really on Anthony Blunt as a key character because um, we're at the Courtauld and I'm going to focus a little bit, at least on my part of the talk, on the historical aspects, um, kind of end with the contemporary and maybe the Q&A and the discussion between Nadim and I can talk about um, some of these more contemporary digressions or tentacles that the project leads into. So it first started as a project um, in an exhibition called Counterintelligence, which was a research exhibition I did at the University of Toronto. It was a project where I looked at the methodology of the double agent um, as a hybrid matter between an artist and a curator. I was an artist invited to do the show, um, but it ended up being somewhat of a curatorial project between showing over 100 objects, artifacts, documents, agencies, characters, um, personnel into what was a survey project looking at how the worlds of art and the military overlapped. Um, particularly starting with Rubens and the early 1600s, all the way up to contemporary moments. Um, it looked at how artists worked in the military um, and engaged in certain operations and vice versa, how the military borrowed certain strategies from the art world or hired artists 
Um, and that really kind of was focused at the beginning of the 20th century. And then with the Vietnam War, there was quite a schism between, let's say, the art worlds and the military industrial complex. Um, but it started right at the beginning with Ruben as a painter asking for a private sitting with the king and instead of sending an ambassador to negotiate a peace treaty, which would be perhaps very obvious of this kind of junket. Instead, he went to paint a portrait and have that private sitting and was able to engage in geopolitical negotiations under the guise of an artist. And of course, there are several stories like this that occur throughout history and, and that exhibition tried to pull them all together. And one that came out in the research, which is very popular is the story of Sir Anthony Blunt. And I know today's audience is gonna be quite a spectrum from those who perhaps um, studied under him or were colleagues and remember him to people who've never heard of him. So bear with me as I touch on a few um, classic facts um, and hopefully digress into a few moments that people are a little less aware of. Um, the painting at the core was uh, this painting 16 uh, in the 1620s, number 6092. I was very interested in looking at Anthony Blunt in a material way, not just in the pop aspect of TV and, and theater, which a lot of productions have focused around. I really wanted to look at him as a key figure and his intellectual practice um, and what he was building, what he was thinking through and particularly how it related to the Canadian context. I'm a Canadian artist. And um, while the majority of Hollywood productions and exhibitions and critical and investigative journalism look at the major superpowers, trying to hold them accountable and look at narratives, this makes sense um, for the NSA, the CIA, um, the KGB, MI5, MI6. I find that my career has been looking at definitely the territory of Canada as this marginal colonial uh, territory where a lot of the same and uh, players are playing out. Marshall McLuhan once called Canada an anti-environment um, as this kind of boundary resonant zones between the superpowers where important narratives play out in the shadows. And if you're looking at the intelligence operations, uh, an industry or a field that wants to be in the shadows, sometimes looking in the shadow of the shadows is, is a very important place. The Five Eyes Treaty, which connects America, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, is an important intelligence treaty and pact for causing um, a geopolitical breadth in observation. But it also provides a certain tit for tat, a, um, a way to circumvent oversight. What might be requiring oversight in a certain country can be outsourced to a partnering nation. Um, and exchange back for information to exactly that, circumvent surveillance. So in a certain sense, surveillance without surveillance becomes important through these types of treaties. And so articulating the Canadian narrative is a, a very important part of the story while it's not a spectacle all the time. And in doing that, Anthony Blunt's narrative, I think plays out as an important story um, where we can find a, a lot of serendipitous details that reveal the birth of connoisseurship and forensics as it plays out. So um, I particularly wanted to look at this painting that, that I tried to show in counterintelligence, um, but unfortunately the National Gallery wouldn't loan it to me. But when I um, was doing the 2016 Soviet Art Prize, I was giving carte blanche to do a show at the National Gallery. And so it was an offer I couldn't refuse to get into the archives to uh, do a show, show the actual painting, um, show the x-rays, explode the material history, the archival, and look at the institution itself. It's a very um, little known painting um, from about 1620, um, originally, uh, at least uh, when its attribution was done by Anthony Blunt in 1938. Um, but of course, that attribution becomes suspect, which we'll get to in a moment. It, it's a painting that really follows Blunt's whole career. He was a student in Cambridge um, uh, in the 30s. And in his essay for the Apollo magazine in 1938, he discovers this painting. It's actually kind of his first attribution. Um, he finds it in a rural property and based on a label on the back of Palazzo Barberini, perhaps it's a little bit vague what it says as it's a ripped uh, label. He determines that based on Cassius Deo's fragment of history, that this is a historical tableau of the meeting between Augustus and Cleopatra on the conquering of the territory, that perhaps Mark Anthony's sword is being held in the one hand, and then there's this pouch in between at the center of the painting. And it's this black pouch, which maybe connects to our, our black box that Nadine is talking about, which I'm really interested in. 
these kind of formal black holes which we circulate around um, as we try to sketch out what we can't see what we can't directly observe by looking at the contextual situation around it and so it's with this overlap that i wanted to look at art and intelligence um, these communities together to look at how one observes things you can't see directly there's a maxim in the intelligence community that says intelligence is knowledge with a shelf life and so it's that kind of knowledge within context is that knowledge connected to various things which has value and it's constantly changing and it's within this historical moment that it becomes important so quickly to give a bio for those who don't know anthony blunt is a is, is a uh, student in cambridge he gets recruited by the soviets of course at that time there's that deep deep um, schism between fascism and communism within Europe, the, um, the, between the wars. He goes on to um, work for the Warburg uh, Journal, becomes one of the first editors of that as a young academic at the Virgin kind of discourse of this, and then become the director of the Courtauld, as we've mentioned a few times today. It's in that moment he talks about this painting and describes it and uses Cassiasteo's theme that this is actually a pouch of love letters that Cleopatra is giving to Augustus. The love letters are to his predecessor, Julius Caesar, his uncle. And so in a sense, it's offering this secret correspondence of love as uh, an offering in a political moment of conquering to cement some type of agreement. Now, this is 1938 that Blunt pauses this idea in a certain sense to imagine what is the contents of this unknown black box. And what I find very serendipitous, and I use that term very clearly based on Carlos Ginsburg etymology of that term, what's serendipitous about this is how all of a sudden the Mark Anthony missing in the painting as this third part of the triangle becomes as important in the narrative of the painting as outside of the narrative of the painting of Sir Anthony Blunt. What I mean by that is, after he uh, writes about this painting at the, in, the, in the war, we all know, of course, he goes on to be a double agent for the Soviets, but what was his original role at MI5? It's not very well known, but he was part of a project called Triple X, which actually was tasked with breaking into diplomatic pouches. So this, um, this black box, again, this secret correspondence for foreign relations, for diplomatic communication within a wartime, becomes actually the role that he's supposed to uh, break in and find the contents one way or the other. Um, and so we have the black pouch of the painting suddenly come into the black pouch of politics. Um, and it's not the other way around. He's not creating this fictitious narrative and theory after he does it in real life. It's, it's of course, strangely the other way. Even more so beyond that one singular moment of the iconography of the painting, we see that uh, if we if we read in the bios of what was going on after the war in fractured Europe, Blunt is tasked still part of MI5 and now is the newly minted surveyor of the King's Pictures, or essentially the curator of the Royal Family's collection. He's tasked to go to fractured Europe to discover, first of all, to Schloss outside of Frankfurt, the correspondence of the Royal Family um, with the Germans, of course, a very sensitive correspondence. And so he's tasked with turning that correspondence again, um, through a diplomatic pouch to the royal family in England, and then later on to recover some other valuables, which again are transferred through territories through the diplomatic pouch. Now, it's, of course, this combination of the double agent, not only between um, the curatorial role and the espionage role, which I'm interested in, it's the political conscience that comes in when it's discovered in 1979, when Margaret Thatcher reveals that he is a double agent for the Soviets during that time, that we question a lot of his intelligence operations and he becomes obviously, um, uh, his, his intellectual patriotic work becomes under auspices or under, let's say, suspicion of his intellectual activity as well. Um, the National Gallery, when it collected this painting, of course, bought it on retainer from Blunt, who was selling works to the AGO, the Art Gallery of Ontario and the National Gallery of Canada um, to build their collections. These are kind of early institutions. And um, he was selling masterpieces to them through the wire, uh, collecting, becoming a consultant, helping train the curators, helping build the Henry Moore collection at the Art Gallery of Ontario. He was doing all this intellectual work for them. 
Now this painting became a little bit suspect and was stripped of its attribution in the 70s um, under a lot of controversy. Um, Blunt held that it was still a Poussin painting to his day, um, but also his competitors, shall we say, uh, were fighting against that. Now, Poussin wasn't the household name that he is today before Blunt really did all the survey shows, the Catalogue Raison, and really built um, kind of a contemporary appreciation of Poussin. So it's, it's interesting to kind of see a painting um, come out of the ashes as it's discovered to go through this controversial attribution and then deattribution. And actually, if you dive into the archives of the National Gallery, we see in the 70s, actually, the majority of scholars that are visiting the National Gallery looking at the painting and corresponding based on radiographs and so forth, start to think that actually maybe it was a mistake. And the curator um, himself at the National Gallery started to doubt um, that maybe he was a little ambitious uh, in stripping it and that it should be returned. Of course, when 1979 happens and his political uh, credibility um, becomes suspect, the painting gets buried into um, to the archives, never really to be discussed again whether it's really a Poussin or not. So this narrative becomes interesting in a larger geopolitical issue and something that I've been very interested in researching over the last few years, which is the birth of connoisseurship and forensics. Um, and the 1620s, when this painting was supposedly um, authored, if we follow Blunt's narrative, uh, currently, it's an Italian unknown school, about 1630 to 1650, um, which you can see according to the National uh, Gallery of Canada's um, current um, status. But if we look at the 1620s, there's basically four characters that are really interesting, um, generating pretty much um, the birth of certain modern discourses. And the first, of course, is Galileo, looking at the empirical and experimental, um, something that uh, Carlos Ginzburg in his writing talks about the predictive methodology in a certain sense. If you can observe the natural laws, you set up an experiment, you have a control. If you can repeat that experiment again and again, it means that there is a law there and therefore you can predict what will happen. And that becomes very applicable to science, not only in the laboratory, but in the real world, because you can reconstruct and know that law and predict how that law will play out. That's a predictive method that Galileo, at the same time, the same court for Pope Urbane, there is a doctor by the name of Mancini. And through this empirical method of observations of symptoms of the body, he starts to analyze how pathologies are occurring. And of course, symptoms are the symbols or the signs of an underlying sickness. And so it's a doctor that at the same time is an art antiquities dealer that starts to really observe these symptoms within the body within actual small details, which becomes an important method called the conjectural method. So it's the predictive versus the conjectural that occurs. Um, in this sense, the conjectural is reverse engineering tracks, like animals in the snow that leave traces. The idea when you can't reproduce an experiment in the laboratory like science is that you can't reproduce his story. Right? You can't reproduce all of the micro events that occur you have to, in a certain sense, posit how causation occurs by imagining backwards the trace of these events. It's in this sense that one's trying to trace the actual symptom in the medical, but also trace the history of an object's creation, its attribution. And as antiquity dealer that wanted to, of course, not be scammed by forgeries, the idea was to observe the minute details in the margins based out of a new science of handwriting at the time, Mancini observes that actually if a forgery was to happen, you wouldn't follow what the most obvious, spectacular moments of a master's hands would be, the eyes, the face, the hands, these moments where genius is greatest appreciated, but rather it would be in the earlobes, it would be in the curve of the hair, it would be in the curves of the fold, of course lots of curves because this is the, 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 the kind of Baroque era here with the curvature of lines, but it's within these moments of the small curves that one should observe whether something is fake or real. This Mancini method goes on to be the Morelli method later on as, as Ginsburg traces and becomes one of the main methods for analyzing if artworks are, or antiquities are real or not. It of course goes through a certain sense of the detective fiction. It goes through this idea of tracing of whether something is um, uh, happening according to this conjectural method. 
and of course, um, whether one is reading these characters that Mancini's talking about with handwriting or the characters within a painting itself, Poussin was one of the first uh, artists to really talk about reading a painting itself. He's very literary and his tableaus were of course based on historical fragments like Blunt is positing. And it's kind of, he's famous for saying when a collector didn't like his work, he needs to be more read or better read in order to appreciate his artwork. It wasn't an aesthetic sense, but really it was about understanding and being intellectually informed to understand the value of where painting was. The third character um, that is surrounding Poussin at this time is not only Galileo Mancini, but Grotius, the father of international law, who really sets up kind of um, the protocol for these diplomatic relations and trying to establish an international legal system in order for peace to occur um, and to mediate. And so the idea of diplomacy, the idea of the diplomatic pouch, all comes really out of these moments of trying to establish um, these roles of science, conjectural ideas, and uh, legal frameworks of international um, relations. So it's with that that um, the, the painting kind of functions within. Um, it, the exhibition itself um, follows a Warburg kind of two-step two process. As Nadine was saying, we really didn't want to just reconstruct a CAD model or really just uh, quickly flip online something that was um, a reconstruction in a virtual space. We wanted to look at how this information, how this tracing of history, how these connecting of information and evidence really plays out. And of course, the, the atlas from Warburg, which has been used again and again within the curatorial method and the iconology of tracing the migration of images becomes really important. This idea of images having their own connection across time, across mediums, across disciplines becomes super important. That a, a, an email or a telegram um, or a newspaper clipping or a freeze or an art history painting can all connect, they're all related to each other. Um, people have kind of made intimations about how the detective um, board where we connect evidence and try to connect a narrative in a certain sense conjecturally reconstruct all the connections of the characters and evidence together to understand motive, causation, and uh, a story of what happened has been traced a little bit to this type of thinking um, as an art historical methodology. So of course we wanted to look at that in a virtual space, but um, unlike history that freezes these, these images of course only exist as photographs, the tableaus um, uh, do not exist today, they, they were destroyed. Um, they were pinned and they were flexible in, in a certain sense during this research project. And that also posited um, another way to think about things based on the library and the subtitle to this version of this remix, um, because the National Gallery is kind of, let's say, the architectural version of that, this virtual version, we subtitled The Law of the Good Neighbor, um, really looking at the research project of Warburg and the library and how clustering of information and happenstance and serendipity become important and how um, it's not only the, the catalog numbered, it's not only the gallery where two works are hanging on a wall at a moment, but it's the rearrangement of the library and the spines and the books that are next to each other. The law of the good neighbor of how information is related through proximity, not to necessarily a rational argument of the grammar or the rational argument of chronology through time of the isms and the master artists, but rather actually through proximity, um, through interdisciplinarity. And so we created this exhibition display design where we could really look at various aspects of the um, themes of the exhibition. Um, of course, if we look at all 50, it's rather overwhelming. We see a dense nest uh, cluster, but we can kind of go into the various themes of black boxes and look at Wittgenstein's key to his house. Um, we can look at Edgar Allan Poe and Lacan's conversation. We can look at Anthony Blunt um, giving a tour for the BBC looking at Fabergé eggs um, while he's in, in the palace. So we can kind of collect these things at various moments and hang them on the wall and restructure proximity um, and, and play with this a little bit more in this dynamic narrative. So those two became the actual um, frameworks for exhibition design. And then lead us, of course, into the contemporary aspect of this. What does it mean in a geopolitical time um, of, of the art market? The last two objects I'll just kind of close on um, and then we can kind of lead into more of a Q&A or discussion is um, 
the secret and encrypted image in the free port. When we first built the project a few years ago, I looked at particularly the idea of stenography or looking at the image as a, as a secret message. Um, of course, we're all familiar with encryption, encoding, computers of, of mathematical encryption, where the image is only crackable with a key. But there's another way of sending secret messages called stenography. Now, it's not secure. It's more based upon a sleight of hand. It's based on sending information through channels that uh, encrypted images aren't expected. So in one way, a black box or a diplomatic pouch says, this is exactly where the secret is. It's protected by international relations or protected by encryption. Um, and so you can't supposedly crack it. But of course, we know that's not true. And it happens continually from quantum computing through Anthony Blensel triple X project. The other way to perhaps send a secret message is discreetly through a means where one doesn't think a secret message exists. That's called stenography. So we created a image, we created a digital image of the uh, painting itself, which you can see there, and encoded a secret message within it. And that was released kind of um, into the wild um, in that first part. Now, I wanted to update that in 2021 in the middle of this NFT craze, where really a lot of the same questions are happening. Um, a lot of the conversation on NFTs, which is supposedly unique, new, and so forth, really isn't, of course. Um, it's a lot of techno utopianism that's posited on a lot of old ideas from artist contracts, um, such as from Seth Sigalow and, and renewal and, and returns on second market sales. The idea of provenance, of course, is exactly the, the whole discussion of this topic um, of tracing uh, in the blockchain with NFTs versus in the catalog registries of art um, catalogs themselves. So. A lot of the things that are in the NFT obviously already exist. Certification of video artworks, the idea of um, the freely exchanged images, and the idea of authenticity based upon the art market itself. These were all there, and we wanted to kind of play with that. So I created an NFT um, for the project. It's auctioned off in January, very conceptual. Um, the auction price is the same as it was in 1953 for the painting um, and follows Sigalov's resale value. But, the idea was to look at the NFT as the counterpoint to the free port. And the last, this was, you know, project, this is object 49 in the exhibition. And the final number 50 is actually the PowerPoint presentation to the Luxembourg free port, um, famously um, developed by Yves Bouvier. Um, this idea, which I think is kind of the two antithetical moments in contemporary image making, contemporary art. One is the free port, which is kind of the black box of the tax-free haven, the locker where artwork can be exchanged almost outside of geopolitical issues without entering the country, can circulate from one free port to another in a locker. This idea that value is held um, and display is completely hidden versus the NFT where the image is free to circulate, of course, but the ownership is perhaps secretive. The idea of exchange is completely um, an antithetical aspect to the public exchange. So, this becomes really important as two moments, I think, of the physical locker space and the virtual space, the public display, the exchange, and looking at how these questions of surveillance, this idea of the geopolitical exchange of international law, the idea of secret images and encryptions of black pouches all kind of circulate back to an age old story from the 1620s. So maybe I'll leave it there. We can kind of enter into a Q&A or, um, of course, I'm happy to digress into the uh, 50 or so other objects in it, but I wanted to center at the Crotal today, really kind of focus on the narrative of Blunt um, and, and a few of those objects. Well, thanks, Charles. And you can, I'm sure everyone who's been listening uh, can sense just how rich this project is. And, and indeed you, you speak about it so well. It's always uh, a pleasure and, and perhaps uh, sort of strangely surprising to hear an artist speak uh, you know, in this way, which of course attends so, so deeply to art history, um, but not just art history, but its, its methods, um, which is of course extremely interesting uh, here, especially at the Courtauld uh, to consider. Um, and I realized that I was terribly remiss in not introducing you formally before. Um, and I won't do the whole thing, but just suffice to say, Charles, is indeed an academic as well at the 
University of Toronto, um, where he was until recently running the, um, the Visual Arts Studies program. But before that, and, and I think this is so, it comes through in what you're saying, you were indeed a private contractor for the Department of National Defense in Canada. Um, and you were uh, independently researching intelligence operations. So perhaps um, I will just open up the question, just a little bit of background on how, how an artist ends up doing that. Um, mm. and, and I think it might also be worth mentioning the fact that one of your first jobs ever was as, as a radiographer. Mm. So, um, so maybe you could just sort of uh, just dilate a little bit on those, those two related uh, topics briefly. Yeah, I, for me, everything seems naturally connected. Um, and it's not just because I'm maybe paranoid. Uh, there, there definitely is that history. I, I did pay for kind of my philosophy degree as a radiographer um, for a materials engineering firm. We were x-raying military assets and uh, industrial assets. Um, and so it really was this before, before becoming a photographer, before kind of entering art and aesthetics, it really was industrial x-ray taking photographs of the invisible looking at this forensic analysis of failure um, that was my visual language um, it was a way of looking at the world around me and it was only later when I kind of entered into the cinema through my apprenticeship for MGM and Disney doing cinematic work that I actually transferred into the art world so this idea of the art world and the forensics and 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 all of this kind of started at the very beginning the actual engagement with um, the Department of Defense um, was just following, let's say, research. Um, I had been one of the co-founders for the Yukon School of Visual Art, which was setting up an art school in the Canadian Arctic for an Indigenous government and the government and the state. And I was looking at the history of what was there um, and, and the architecture, which is, was my research in grad school. So um, obviously Buckminster Fuller's geodesic domes and radar stations were what were in the backyard. And in, in developing and researching that stuff, I realized there was kind of this war artist loophole this, through the Department of Defense where I could enter in um, and do some research and get access. And so um, after several years of research, found a way to get access to CFS Alert, which is a, the northernmost place in the world. It's a fly in, it took two days to fly through Greenland to the tip of the Canadian archipelago to get there um, and, and look at what was going on. It's interesting because November and stay here in Canada just a few weeks ago, they released uh, War in Canada, the, the historian from the, the military museum just released a, something like a 400 page book looking at the history of war art. And this project is actually located uh, as a key seminal work transitioning that history in, in the country from pretty much an observational description aspect to a critical research practice. Um, and, and that really was a coincidence. At that point, contemporary artists weren't really doing this or accessing. And there was a loophole because of the research um, that I found, which kind of cracked that open. And, and since then now, um, a few more artists are, are able to kind of go in and look at these operations, um, how they're functioning, not only within, um, you know, a bravo heroic aspect of looking at the nation, but looking at how perhaps um, it's a complicated um, political situation. And from that, from those sort of these these interests um, towards your practice as an exhibition maker, I mean, not just as an, an artist who creates photographs or sculptures um, or even installations of your own mm -hmm. materials, but um, you know, this is not the only exhibition you have curated that brings together historical documentation with mm -hmm. objects uh, of you know, as it were, you know, created by your own hand. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, how how does how does the how does you know working with other people's uh, you know, creations or working with archives, um, you know, how does that fit into, into your practice more broadly? Mm -hmm. I mean, really it was kind of the, the double agent, it becomes a theme again and again here because really it's looking at the doubled agency of all of these things, um, how an object might function in an archive, but then be functional in a very contemporary setting and have the double agency where an artist kind of can go into these archives, I think in a much more liberal. I mean, I, I used to also um, direct a cur graduate curatorial program. And, and of course the questions are, what are the ethics of curating? What are the institutional kind of navigations for these things? I'm not an institutional curator. Um, and so in a certain sense, a lot of these projects where you would get invited by a museum as an artist to come in and work with the collection 
or it was my research that was leading me there, it allowed for a lot more play. Um, I'll be really frank. Uh, I remember being actually in an argument with one of the curators at one of the museums I've, I've talked about in the talk and how you could only curate something you love in a certain sense, the curatorial care for something. And I completely was arguing that you can curate something you hate um, completely. And actually, um, as an artist, I think you have a little more freedom um, to do that because that idea um, of whether an object is functioning art historically or whether it's functioning in a contemporary or in a social aspect, whether it's being instrumentalized or it's being beautified is um, always on the table. Um, and in a certain sense, uh, I know a lot of curators outsource this type of work to artists today because they can get away with a little bit more um, and hopefully challenge the institutions with, with their histories, which are sometimes problematic. Um, and, and the artist can come in and actually challenge these collections in a way that institutional curators can't. Um, and of course, the exchange is happening back and forth. So it's happening more and more. I, I just know that in the last, let's say, 15 years, um, starting doing this, let's say, uh, in the, the early 2000s stuff, that, that that's changed a lot. Um, and that these objects suddenly can become troubled um, in, in a new way from, um, you know, yeah. Speaking of someone who spent some time as an independent curator, um, <laughs> I've, I've, I've often thought that the part of the brief for the independent curator is to be a double agent. Um, mm -hmm. In the one, uh, on yeah. the one hand, you know, you you represent, uh, you know, you represent, let's say, the the interests of the artist creatively, intellectually, mm -hmm. to the to the institutional gorgon, um, and you kind of smooth the way for that to happen, perhaps. And then, of course, um, the institution entrusts you. I speak of, of about commissioning contemporary artworks, uh, not not working with uh, historical objects as much. Um, on the other hand, you represent the sort of the, let's say the the material exigencies and, and sort of uh, sort of requirements of institutional thinking to the artist and you kind of you know, you've got a velvet glove over the iron fist, but that's not the case. It's not just a double mm -hmm. agency like that. That's uh, It's always the triple agency and that's where yeah. it gets more fun. And that's where um, I find myself smuggling in my own interests um, under the guise <laughs> of double agent. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, that's, that's a, a thought I had. I think what's exactly, even in the intelligence operations, you read, let's say, CIA manuals, or you read kind of historical handling of the double agent, exactly that. Once you enter that level of the double agent, is it a triple agent? Flipping back is, you never really know. Handling it becomes very tricky. Um, it, it's kind of a classic. Once you crack the door open, uh, it, it becomes an endless mise en beam, really, of, uh, of intentions and, and loyalties, um, which um, plays out in, obviously, lots of different ways. And, and I know that, I, know that, that uh, I, think, I think that this project is successful, successful in the sense that, um, that um, it, you know, it, you know, it, you know it's, it's, it's an entirely new, entirely new form of presentation, as I think of what was an analog exhibition, but um, before we, we go to the questions from the, from the audience, I'd just like to ask, um, you know, how was it for you entering this digital space? I know you're a little bit, uh, say, like, apprehensive about it at first. I mean, I'm so wedded to tactile to sort of three you know exhibitions that sort of I can enter as three-dimensional volumes um, of course in COVID you know we've all been uh, in front of our zoom screens way too long um, and you know in a way perhaps you know the, this curatorial invitation is a bit of does a bit of violence to that sort of sensibility so you know give me the the love and the hate for this project please <laughs> um Oh, geez. Uh, well, I, I mean, a project like this, you can tell, has a real material love. I mean, whether it's really Wittgenstein's key to his closet um, that, you know, one can feel between the fingers or it's the backside of a piece of paper and it's marginal notes or, you know, the, the, the liquid correction and seeing, you know, the transparency versus the opacity in the actual material documents to the glow of, of the X-ray. Um, obviously a project like this loses that material and, and the pure pleasure in that. Because of course, this isn't at the end of the day, a book. Um, I'm not writing a research paper. Um, there is of course a catalog and there's an essay. I have published the work in peer review articles for Chicago Press and these things come out as academic things. But when it comes to the exhibition itself, 
when it comes to what I think is the magic of the artist being able to stitch things together and set up a detective type situation where the agency of the viewer comes in and they really want to piece things together and you don't necessarily lay out the argument that material aspect is really important so that i felt was really struggling working with other web developers um someone like jules laplace who was great who built the engine on this people like brandon pool who did a lot of the cad work um raf rennie who did the design work for it like there are amazing people to work with and they have their own skills which definitely is why we're working with them because I don't have that material digital aspect. That is the easy thing to say. Um, it's a new project still, so I'm trying to figure out what is the benefit of, of, um, of the digital. I mean, the obvious answer is that everyone can see it. What You don't have to travel to the National Gallery to dive into a room um, and, and search through the vitrines that this kind of has an archival element to it that lives on and people can kind of investigate and, and find. I know that there's so much information and there's so much detail that you can get lost forever. And so in this sense, we really loved how you can kind of navigate and click at your own pace and read the material, come back to it um, and participate in what becomes hopefully an engine for further research and investigation and perusing, um, which has always been important. Right back from when I was doing stuff in the Arctic, I mentioned of reconstructing a whole radar station and then creating a digital archive that was the original blueprints. These things hopefully go hand in hand. But I would also add just briefly um, mm -hmm. this: the the kind of the fact that the associations can be kind of recombined and turned around and looked at from different angles. I find that to be one of the more interesting aspects mm -hmm. of the the way the yeah. site is used. But I know that Leila is here, and we would like mm -hmm. to turn it over to the audience. Yeah, thank you both so much. We have about 10 minutes now to go through the audience questions. So if everyone wants to continue to send these to me via the chat, I will ask as many as I can. Um, but first up, we have a question from Jane. And Jane's asking, do you think it's problematic that institutions almost rely on artists to be new voices or create interventions with, um, with the problematic objects? Um. Do you want me to go on that, Nadim? I mean, uh, we can maybe both comment on that. I don't think it's a problem. I mean, it's only a problem if you exclusively rely on it, which is maybe what the the in between the lines is saying. I mean, artists are continually, um, you know, performing the new, whether it's new tactics or new markets. Um, that, that's generally the role of the artist to kind of somehow squeeze all of their soul <laughs> performatively into that moment to be exploited. Um, that would be the cynicism, I would say. But no, I, I think it's a great moment because they have the flexibility, as we were saying with the double agent, um, it allows for that movement. So it's a double edged sword where artists can come in and do that. And I, and I think they can lead it. They can challenge things when you're doing new things. You can also be wrong. Um, if you're being experimental, you know, sometimes pushing the limit is a good idea. Uh, if you're institutional having to deal with politics long term, your sometimes hands are tied and you can't be as experimental. So the, the other side to that is it's not a problem. It's, it's an opportunity, really, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I follow that. Um, I think uh, the artist can can be very wrong, too. And one of the benefits of it, <laughs> of it being an artist who's very wrong is you can move on institutionally. You can kind of, you know, your, the, the curators can, they can stay, you know. Um, uh, so no, that no, I, I think it's not a problem uh, at all. Great. The question is, the question is how how experimental can curators be mm -hmm. um, within an institution, um, and would we like them to be? Is that really the role? These are these are harder questions to address when you are, um, you know, a repository of like very you know valued uh, and like sort of important objects that kind of are supposed to be brought together maybe to tell the history of. Uh, or to, to bolster a uh, kind of a vision for a nation, for example, like a national museum. It's a different story. Yeah. yeah, it's complicated. And I guess it is also a lot about collaboration and doing things authentically when you do do them. Um, the next question we have is from Linda. And Linda's asking, did you study the methods of Edward mm. Waldo <laughs> Forbes at the Fog at Harvard? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Um, th now, this takes me back several years ago. Um, and of course, a lot of the original work and pedagogy um, happened for the fog. Um, it didn't really make the cut into the exhibition, primarily because um, of the Courtauld's work and, and Stephen Rees-Jones, particularly on Poussin and his publications on that. So 
I was really, really interested in, in trying to stay as close to home. Part of the problem is when you are exploding everything so broadly from UN convention documents um, through to uh, paintings, you kind of have to make your choices. And so I stuck with um, Jones's research at the Courtauld and his development of radiography as an important conversation. Um, part of the project actually is looking at his notes on that in, in the database. Um, I also, there's about five little tiny art projects that I snuck into the 50. And one of them was something called the Courtauld Cocktail, the Courtauld Cocktail which was um, a reconstruction of an object that students were making. They discovered that they were actually stealing chemicals from the, from the uh, laboratory to make Molotov cocktails for the uh, political protests and, uh, and um, parades at the time. And they discovered, because of course, uh, film was uh, flammable, um, nitroglycerin, that cellular base, that the fuses could be used. So I reconstructed a Molotov cocktail based on some stories coming out of the, the lab at the court told. So I kind of stuck more to that than the amazing work, of course, by Forbes, but um, props to, to his work is very, very important. That's not the Courtauld I knew. So, um, <laughs> what, and I'm pretty sure the people attending today um, uh, don't, don't recognize that uh, in the current institution. So when exactly was that, Charles? Um, this is um, basically, uh, well, during war, uh, basically wartime. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, 30s, 30s and 40s. Mm -hmm. um, is when the story was that they discovered they had kind of locked down the lab. Is my is my understanding of that. the the home the the home and it was before Molotov cocktails was even a name. That's why we called the Courtauld cocktail. But um, there was actually um, you can go to the military the, the military museum, the Imperial Museum there in London, and see how to make homemade cocktails as for the also invasion of defense. So it was also part of the national education to defend oneself to how to create these these. Uh, um, enter, you know, these explosive um, devices. I loved it because the image itself, right, the fuse of the image, photography, the image itself can be explosive um, and not just representational. The image can be the fuse to ignite a debate, a conversation, a fire on the street. That's amazing. I didn't know that. So that's super interesting. I'm sure everyone who's joining from the Courtauld also didn't know that. So that's great. Yeah. And that actually leads on to probably the last question we've got time for, which is from Alan. And Alan's asking, do you look at the collection and commissioning of art in wartime? I've worked a little in the archives of London's Imperial War Museum, which you just mentioned, mm -hmm. where they keep papers to do with schemes run in Britain in both world wars, intended by to record war and at least in the eyes of the schemes director in World War II to keep good artists alive. Um, and the First World War scheme very much followed in the slipstream of a generous and large mm. Canadian mm. scheme. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very complicated conversation. I really do not mind um, getting into these, let's say, more complicated conversations. Um, I think a project of this hopefully doesn't distinguish between areas, whether it's the War Museum or the National Gallery or the Art Institution, that actually um, Charles Comfort, who was the director of the National Gallery, um, who was a war artist, for instance, in Canada, um, these things are, are not simple. And um, it's, it's not really about being a pacifist or a warmonger. Um, the reason why I got in to go back to maybe Nadine's first question is that I, I was doing work on architecture and communications. And of course, basically when you hit the 20th century, most of these things come through um, some type of military or national defense issue. And it's, it's, it's long been in the art world, something to shy away from. Um, and I think uh, it's an important part of history we need to look at, we need to investigate both in its sense of logistics, its sense of geopolitics, um, all of it. And, and actually looking at the artists that have participated in it and as artists looking at these issues is just as important on both sides of it. Yeah, and to add that, I mean, any embrace of uh, digital art and more specifically art online uh, has to confront the fact that the the, the internet is sort of stems from uh, you know at least in large part military um, sort of de developmental projects and um, the the sort of the surveillance and indeed the ongoing uh, sort of securitized aspects of everything we do online um, and how that feeds into of course questions of national identity and questions of identity in in general even they put down right down to personal identity if not uh, also the, the identity of, uh, you know, what is a particular uh, image versus, uh, you know, a version. Um, this is where NFTs and, and blockchain comes in. 
uh, as well. So I think these are all very live issues. Um, this is one of the reasons uh, that I find Charles's project and, and, and you know, his research so compelling. Um, and, and, and one of the reasons why I really thought that uh, bringing it back on, putting it online in, in a sort of digital native uh, kind of manner might be appropriate. Um, so I have to thank you, Charles, for, for agreeing to do that and for presenting uh, the, your fascinating work to, to me and uh, everyone else here. I just know now that, for instance, you know, it might be a little bit harder to travel with titles and talks like this and more stuff online. It, it was a it was a moment when I was shooting a film for the Department of this 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 weird loophole that they, when this Edward Snowden stuff broke out, and I was the only one who had footage of this intelligence station because I'd somehow gotten into it. And when investigative journalism was trying to use images, they had contacted me, and it was one of those moments where you try to navigate the ambiguity for future access and debate conversations going on or whether in the public sphere now um, a lot of this conversation is out there and of course at the end of the day that's the idea to to really have a public conversation and so um uh travel might be a little more difficult but i think the work is worth it well thank you both so much for an absolutely fascinating hour we really appreciate you coming on and talking us through everything but unfortunately that's all we've got time for and um, always races by and we've only got one hour to do these events so yeah thank you both again and thanks for everyone for joining us at home this event has been recorded and it will be on the course World youtube channel very soon so please do stay in touch and check out everything else we have on at the court hall and also check out everything that's been talked about this evening i will see you all very soon at another event thank you have a nice night everyone thanks David.